Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Fiber Broadband Association's Fiber for Breakfast. We're now on our 24th episode of 2023. Before we kick off, I'd like to thank Westco, the platinum sponsor of Fiber for Breakfast, and our gold sponsor, Graybar. You know, on Monday, USDA awarded $714 million from the RUS Reconnect program for 33 build outs in 19 states to 90,000 locations. These awards represent about two thirds of the $1.15 billion from Reconnect Round Four. I'd also like to say congratulations to our good friend Vanith Engar as Gumbo 2.0 passed the Louisiana legislature and is awaiting the governor's signature. So I know Vanith has Louisiana ready to roll, and I know that as soon as the bead money is allocated on June 30th, they're going to be going full force with their uh, bead grants. So Congratulations, Vanith. Uh, next week, Online for All will be kicking off an, an Affordability Connectivity Program Week of Action. That's June 14th to 22nd. So to sign up for the Week of Action, you can sign up at onlineforall.org forward slash week of action. It's week dash of dash action. The ACP Week of Action brings together organizations from all sectors to spread awareness about this program's to millions of people to help thousands of new households get enrolled and tell the story of how ACP is helping to close the digital divide for students and their families and all Americans. Also, I'm gonna be getting on a plane here this weekend and heading out to Lake Tahoe for our next Regional Fiber Connect workshop for June 21st. So it's not too late to register. Um, I can't wait to see you guys there. Lake Tahoe could not be better, June 21st. Also, registration has been open and going for Fiber Connect 23 in Orlando. This is our big, big, big event. Um, <laughs> our registration so far has been faster than all our years, the last five years put together. Um, it is great. So we're gonna have the biggest and best fiber broadband event in the world this year with over 4,000 attendees and an amazing program. Uh, the event will definitely sell out as it's done in the past two years. So Please don't wait to register and get book your room right away at the Gaylord. Also today at 11 a.m., please join us for our latest web episode of Where's the Funding? On how to leverage the Capital Projects Fund to match resources from private sources for bead grant applications with Chris Perlitz from the Municipal Capital Markets Group. It's gonna be a great session. You're not gonna to wanna to miss it. That brings us to today's fiber session with our great friend, Greg Williams of Prisbian to share with us trends in fiber cable, the top three trends in fiber optic cable. But before I formally introduce today's guest, I'd like to introduce Tris Ehlers from team who's gonna walk us through some housekeeping items. Thanks so much, Gary. Good morning to everyone who's joined us today. Before I go over a few logistical items, we'd like to once again thank the platinum sponsor of Fiber for Breakfast, Westco, and our gold sponsor, Great Bar. Now, if everyone would just keep in mind that you are in listen mode only, you can ask a question at any time by typing it into the question box within your control panel on the right side of your computer screen. We'll host a Q&A session with our panelists at the end of today's webinar. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on FBA's website within 24 to 48 hours. You can find the recording in the events tab under the Fiber for Breakfast drop-down option. At the conclusion of today's presentation, you'll be prompted to complete a brief feedback survey. Please take a minute to do that. We truly appreciate your input. I'll pass it back to Gary now to introduce our panelists and get us started. Gary? Well, thanks, Trish, and good morning. I'm Gary Bolton, the President and CEO of the Fiber Broadband Association. Last week on Fiber Breakfast, we heard from David Eckert of Nokia, who discussed no regrets, how to make the most of a once in a lifetime investment. David discussed how fiber pawn technology provides a no regret network architecture that's easy to scale for both residential and business use with the inherent ability to support G pawn, XGS pawn, 25 gig pawn, 100 gig pawn, everything that's gonna be happening in the future. So, um, you know, basically it was a great session. So please watch the replay of that if you haven't seen it. And David is always so much fun. Today on Fire for Breakfast, we have the pleasure of hearing from our good friend, Greg Williams of Prisbium to share with us trends in fiber cable, the top three trends in fiber optic cable. 
And for those of you who know Greg, Greg is the master of history of fiber optics. I don't know anybody that knows the history better than him. Uh, Greg is the business unit director with Prisbium. He's responsible for the leadership of the specialty business unit. He's been with Prisbium for 18 years, has a wealth of knowledge and expertise in fiber optic cable. His lengthy career includes director of sales and business development at Draca Communications, where he spent nearly a decade. Oh, he also spent nearly a decade with Procter & Graham Gamble. So he earned his engineering degree from NC State, go Pack. Um, so with that, welcome, Greg. And for our audience, please type in your questions to go, and we'll get them in the Q&A at the end. So with that, I'll turn things over to Greg. Okay, very good. Thank you, Gary, and good morning, everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity today to kind of share some views of major trends that are occurring in the world of fiber optic cable. And I also want to say I just appreciate personally the strong voice that the Fiber Broadband Association has brought to our industry, and it's been a major impact, I will tell you that. A little bit about Prismian. Uh, we're a large-scale manufacturer of optical fiber as well as fiber optic cable in North America, as well as across the globe. You know, in North America, we have thousands of employees who I'm, I'm very proud of who every day are making optical fiber and fiber cable um, at our factories in North Carolina and South Carolina and Tennessee and in Mexico. You know, we've been in this business for about over 30 years and the Prisbean Group really represents our combined mergers of companies that were Alcatel and Draca and Pirelli and General Cable. So again, Gary, thank you for the time today and I hope uh, we'll, I'll provide some interesting facts here. So let's go to slide two, Trish. So we'll touch on three things and, and kind of one concluding point today. And my focus really is about fiber optic cable. That's really my area of expertise. So we'll talk about demand, how much fiber cable is being bought and deployed uh, across the US and Canada. Topic number two will be what's going on with bending sensitive fiber. Um, we'll talk about that for a little bit. A fairly new trend, I say new, five years or so, 200 micron fiber. We'll talk a little bit about what's going there and then we'll kind of wrap it all up with the gold star today of, of uh, high density, small diameter cable. So those will be the topics that we touch on today over the next 10 or 12 minutes. Trish, let's go to slide three. Okay, this slide represents the actual demand of fiber optic cable for the past 10 years, plus the demand that we expect is coming for the coming seven years. Now you, you say, okay, you know, what are we talking about here? So we're talking about the total demand in the US and Canada. So this is this does not have Mexico or, or Central America. So the blue bars to the left represent that past 10 years of actual demand and the red bars to the right are representing our prediction of the coming seven years. Now this data that, that I'm showing here represents the production output of all North American manufacturers. This is not just Prismian data, this is all North American manufacturers. You say, well Greg, what are the what are the what's the unit of measure here? What are we looking at? So the unit of measure for this slide is kilometers of fiber. It's not feet or miles of, of cable, but it's a measure of total kilometers of the fiber strands that are inside of the cable. So this is millions of fiber kilometers. And as an industry, that's kind of how we, one of the key metrics, we, we count miles and feet of sheath cable, but we also count the total quantity of fiber strands that are inside. It's a key metric of our industry. If you look at the blue bars, uh, which is the past 10 years from 2013 to 2022, it's a great trend. Uh, we're seeing steady growth year over year at an annual compound growth rate of 14%. Now, wouldn't you like to make that in the stock market today? But steady growth, 10 years at a compound annual growth rate of 14%. If you break it down, you'll see that fiber demand has tripled since 2015 and it's doubled since 2018. And that's just 
fantastic. It just shows you know, the value that we're bringing to our country. Now, the red bars to the, to the right are our projections of the coming seven years. Now, we're trying to factor in our estimations of BEAD and RDOC, capital funds, as well as other private, state, federal funding programs. Now, I mean, we use our best analytical methods and modeling to kind of come up with, you know, what we think the future is going to look like. But honestly, there are times I should just get the old magic eight ball and shake that a little bit and see what that tells me about the future. So we try our best, but golly, sometimes the old magic eight ball would be would be good. But if you step back and just look at the slide, it, it's just fantastic. 10 years of solid growth behind us at a 14% annual growth rate, uh, seven good years ahead of us at probably a growth rate of seven to 10%. So, you know, kind of concluding this slide about, you know, this is the trend of fiber demand. Most of the major manufacturers have been heavily investing in keeping up with uh, this growth. So if you look at the major manufacturers, we spent the past five years doing plant capacity expansions. You have to expand cable plants. You have to expand plants that make fiber. So you've got to keep up with the current demand as well as get ready for the future demand. And I'll tell you, being in the business 23 years, expansions of fiber plants and, and cable plants, it's not cheap and it's not quick. But I compliment all of the major manufacturers in our industry for responding really well to you know, the progress and the and the, the demand for, for broadband in our industry. Chris, let's go to slide four. Okay, the next trend we'll talk about is bend and sensitive fiber, um, which falls under the ITU category G657. So we'll hear me talk about G657 fiber, which is bend and sensitive fiber. And so Greg, what's bend and sensitive fiber? Well, it's a single mode fiber that it's, has great performance in the field in real world conditions where the fiber is constantly going through bends. It bends during your deployment, bends through the lifetime of uh, you know, installation. So if you think of you know, installing fiber cable, whether it's outdoor or indoor, you're going up and down poles, you're making right and left turns, you're avoiding grandma's flower bed, fire hydrants, you name it. And so fiber is not uh, you know, a technology where you just lay the cable straight and it's always straight. So bend and sensitive fiber has become a very important part of, of our industry in helping with deployments. Now the focus of the slide here is the, the gray line or the little orange bars. So that gray line represents the growth of bend and sensitive fiber over the past 10 years, and it's quite a growth trend. Today, bend and sensitive fiber represents at least 50% of all single mode fiber deployed across the USA and Canada. So we're at least using 50% bend and sensitive G657 fiber and the traditional single mode, which is called G652.D, is declining. It's on its way, declining down while G657 increases. Now, when we talk about bend and sensitive fiber, there's three levels of bend and sensitive fiber that's available. So G657A1, so there's an A1 category, an A2 category, and a B3 category. So G657A1 is by far the most widely used bend and sensitive fiber, and it's over 90% of all bend and sensitive fiber used. A1 fiber has a 10 millimeter bend radius, and it's really becoming the dominant single mode fiber used in both outdoor cables as well as indoor cables. And your major manufacturers are, are producing G657A1 fiber. A2 fiber, G657A2, is about 6% of all bend and sensitive fiber used. And an A2 fiber has a 7.5 millimeter bend radius, whereas the A1 had a 10 millimeter. But I will tell you, this is where we're seeing tremendous growth in the G657, say that 100 times, A2 category, particularly in small 
diameter high density cables. Now you can use A2 fiber in many applications, indoor and outdoor, but we're really seeing this trend help us as an industry produce smaller diameter high density cables. And in a minute, I'll close up with how we see that playing out. So the last category is G657B3 thinnest sensitive fiber. Now that's probably less than 3%. We estimate about 3% of all thinnest sensitive fiber that's used, but it is ideal if you're in an environment, which is usually indoors, where you've got many tight bends or even stapling of the cable. I would say 100% of G657B3 fiber is used for indoor applications. Uh, and this fiber has a five millimeter bend radius. So think of taking a fiber and wrapping it around a pencil or a pen multiple times, and the fiber barely recognizes that it's being bent. You, you lose very little attenuation or power loss. And if you really want to kind of get the idea of where B3 fiber would be used, imagine you're in you know, New York City in a high rise building that's 15 stories high and you're starting in the basement and you've got to go 15 stories and down to the ninth apartment at the end of the hallway. I mean, you could easily have 50 to 100 90 degree bends as you go through the closets and elevator shafts and things like that. And this is the ideal situation where a B3 fiber would be used. So in summary, business sensitive fiber is here. It's already 50% of the market demand, and we expect to see steady continued growth of this type of fiber throughout our industry. All right, Trish, let's go to slide five. Okay, next topic, next trend is 200 micron fiber. So for most of my 23 years in the industry, single mode fiber was 250 microns in size. So this is the size, the diameter of an individual fiber. But we're seeing an increasing trend in our industry towards the use of 200 micron fiber. Now today, I would still say that 90% of our industry is using 250 micron, but 10% has now transitioned over to 200 micron fiber. And I think that trend is going to continue on a growth curve. Now, there's some things I want to talk about in this trend that will settle your nerves when it comes to talking about 200 micron fiber. Point number one, the core glass and the cladding glass inside the fiber are identical, whether it's a 200 micron or 250. So, you know, when you splice fiber together, you're splicing the, the nine micron core and the 125 micron glass, and whether it's a 200, 250, they're identical. So you're in good shape there. The diameter change comes by reducing the thickness of the two coatings that are around the inner glass. And that's where it you know, changes from 250 micron down to 200. Well, your first reaction might be, big deal. You know, what difference is this going to make? between 250 micron and 200 micron. Greg, that's just peanuts. Well, I'm gonna tell you that this change can lead to a 20 to 30% reduction in the size of the cable, particularly when you're talking 288 fibers all the way up to 6,912 fibers. That's not gonna make a tremendous difference in your low fiber count cables. But, you know, when you talk about changing the diameter, reducing the diameter of a 288, 432, 864 cable by 20 or 30 percent, I mean, you're talking some significant positive effect here. And I'll talk, I'll show more of that in just a minute. My fourth point about 200 micron fiber is, you know, this isn't an experimental thing. You know, it's been deployed in our industry for over 10 years. It's tried and true, it's tested, it's working great, and it's proving to be very reliable. So you don't have to worry, you know, about the long-term reliability of 200 micron fiber. And my last point is 200 micron fiber is used in both ribbon style cables as well as uh, loose tube style cables. So I know someone's gonna ask, well, what about splicing this stuff? So 
you know, is it possible to splice a 250 micron fiber to a 200 micron fiber? Or is it possible to splice a 200 micron fiber to another 200 micron fiber? And the answer is yes to both. Uh, remember, the core and the cladding are identical. So, you know, we're splicing same diameter cores and same diameter cladding glass to each other. So inside a single fiber fusion splicer, it's not gonna recognize any difference at all. But you say, well, wait a minute, what about ribbon cables? Well, mass fusion rib ribbon splicing can be done 200 micron to 200 micron or 200 micron to 250 micron. So you can buy a, a splice machine that'll do 200 to 200, or you can get adapter kits that'll take existing splicers and allow a 200 micron ribbon on one side and a 250 micron ribbon on the other. And I give compliments to our splice manufacturers here in the country that have done a great job over the last five years helping us advance and making the splicing aspect be uh, irrelevant in today's world with these two. So it's pretty common to use 200 micron fiber and I think it'll continue to grow. All right. Let's get to the star of the show, Trish. Let's go to slide six. And I'll wrap up, wrap up here uh, just a minute on, on this one. So the star of the show today is when you combine a venesensitive fiber with a 200 micron fiber. And that's really the star of the show where we're going today. Um, to me, it's a game changer. You put the venesensitive fiber with a 200 micron fiber, you reduce the size of the cable by 20%. So, okay, how does the end user win? Well, here's how they win. You get more fibers in a duct. You can almost get two to three number, two to three times the number of fibers in a duct that you could before. That's real savings. Number two, you can get longer lengths on a reel. So you buy a big reel of cable and before it only had 20,000 feet. Well, now that same reel comes with 30,000 feet. You have less splice points, easier to deploy. So that's real savings. The third one is the ability to use micro ducts, which is a great growing trend in our industry. So, you know, small diameter ducts, 10 millimeter and 14 millimeter ducts. The combination of 200 micron fiber with benesensitive fiber now lets you put a 432 fiber cable in a 10 millimeter duct and an 864 fiber cable in a 14 millimeter duct. It seems crazy, but it's true. And before, if I just go back five years ago, without G657 fiber and without 200 micron fiber, Somebody would have thought I had three heads if I said you could get 432 fibers in a 10 millimeter duct or 864 in a 14 millimeter. So, you know, just closing, I know we're running out of time. You know, I hope these trends are helpful to you, it's provided you some good information. I mean, it's a great time to be in the fiber industry. We're making great progress for our country. And Again, I give great credit to the Fiber Broadband Association for helping us unify, influence government, and really serve the people of our country better. So there we go. Gary and Trish, back to you. All right, Greg. Always such an amazing amount of information. Hey, Trish, uh, real back to slide nine. I want to start with the uh, demand uh, slide. So we had a number of questions on here. But what I think it's really instructive here. I love this chart because right now we have a lot of people confused. You know, every CEO is trying to explain what happened, right? Because you know, we went to these 52 week lead times and now all of a sudden production has kind of stopped. We're in this pause. So if I look at your chart, what it really shows is that we had basically when people were trying to hoard fiber, so they built up this huge supply. And then now we're seeing is this a little anomaly where in 2023 where people are working down their inventories, but this, but this, so this is a fiber um, demand. But when you look at the actual deployment, deployment doesn't have this little anomaly. People are deploying like crazy. So it's just, mm -hmm. is that what you're seeing? Is it just a working down some inventory what we're seeing this year? It, it is, Gary. I mean, there was a little panic buying going on last year. 
Um, and we see a fair amount of inventory at, you know, contractor yards and distributors and, and at the end users. But uh, that's working itself down pretty quickly. We think it's a short-term kind of impact, but I think it was mostly driven by the panic buying last year. And a lot of that's now settled down. But, uh, you know, if it, after all these years of growth, to have a year that's the same or slightly down feels almost terrible to us, but it's really not terrible. Uh, it's still pretty good and things are gonna grow very quickly uh, within the next 12 to 18 months again. All right, uh, thanks Trish on that slide. Uh, so I got a lot of questions about, um, you know, what's the trade off of going with thinner coating rather than thicker coating? So it's amazing. I mean, I got my little glob from visiting your plant and it's amazing that you can take your preform and just have it drip into perfect dimensions to have get to your 250 micron or 200 micron and still have a uh, nine millimeter or micron what is it nine micron core right core so it's mm -hmm. it's absolutely you know magical yeah i mean gary the the beauty of whether it be 200 250 is the glass inside is, is identical right we're just thinning down the coatings on the outside I'd say data today says you don't have to worry about reliability. Uh, there's been years of research and work done by all the manufacturers that make 200 micron fiber, because no one's gonna put a bad product out there. So I'm very pleased with the performance we see of all manufacturers making 200 micron. It's a lot of questions around, so like larger, require, larger cables require larger FOSCs, and what kind of FO, uh, FOSC would we support large lost fiber cables, six, uh, plus 6,000 strands uh, non-ribbon based? Is that? Well, so let me tell you my interpretation of that question is, if the cable gets smaller, then all the components in the network can also get smaller. So a splice case, a fiber optic splice case, splice closure could get smaller. Handholds could get smaller. Vaults could get smaller. So one change in the cable could have positive impact on many other components and again, continue to produce more savings for the end user. So I was really surprised to see that bending sensitive fiber is over 50% now, because I was, I always thought of bending sensitive as more, more indoor, you know, like you see the Google, you know, pasted in corners and apartments and things like that, um, which I think would be B3, but what what is the i mean are, is everything going to be going to bend intensive would that be 100 percent one time and is there any reason not to have everything bent i mean what's the cost differential and what's the cost differential between a1 a2 and b3 well gary here's i would say this i think bend intensive a1 will continue to grow and and it already is the predominant leader in the in the market and it'll keep growing uh, it's kind of like pulling up to the gas pump. You can get three grades of gas and most everybody buys the low version, right? So that's kind of what we're seeing here. Um, there is a premium as you go. I mean, there's a premium as you go to the A2 and the B3 it gets really expensive. But um, I don't know, Gary, maybe in 10 years, A1, G657 A1 is the standard of the United, you know, North America. It very well could be within 10 years or maybe even before then. So, I mean, when you're buying your fiber, when you look at the overall cost of any project, the physical fiber is just a few percent of the total cost. What's, do you have a, a number on that? Yeah, I think the cost of the fiber cable is typically six to 7% of the total cost to build a network. So the difference between going with uh, Ben and Sensitive, going with A1, it's probably pretty minimal compared to the cost of the project. Exactly. And that's it's, kind of also the rule of thumb is putting as twice as much fiber as you think you need because you'll, you don't want to <laughs> yeah. come back. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the three major manufacturers of optical fiber here in, in North America all have a, a you know, a, a G657 offering. Some are stronger in A1, some are stronger in A2. B3 is pretty small in the big picture, but uh, it's available. It's proven. It's been in the industry 10 years. 
And the A1 version is going to, over time, become the new standard for all of us. 